This is uh, December 3rd, 2015. Great to be in touch. I've been speaking with Phil regarding the possibility of selling some of your leather. When you have a moment, give me a call. It'll be great to discuss. And then from there, yeah, we, we chatted for a while. So. Yeah. So it's kind of funny talking to you two again. And initially, seven or eight years ago, I was kind of started with you both as well. Although I guess in the uh, lifespan of the industry and even the companies, not that long. <laughs> I think of <about> that. <laughs> Although I've got a feeling that Probably my grandfather most certainly crossed paths with yours. Yeah, I bet. We've been in the leather industry probably longer, for sure, for sure, longer than we have been in the hardware. Yeah. So, yeah. So, oh, yeah, that's some, probably your dad, my dad, our grandfathers, I'm sure we've all, they've all crossed paths. Yeah. They were probably in sitting in shoe factory waiting rooms in Maine and Massachusetts yeah. together at some point waiting to talk to <laughs> whoever was buying leather and whatever else. Yeah. All right, Hugh, how are you feeling? Yeah, good. Good. All right, all right. Let's let's uh, let's get into this. Let's start the show. I've got enough coffee in me now, so we can do it. All right, Hugh Harris from Buckle Guys here today. Uh, so glad to, to have you with us. And I've been a customer. I looked this up, Hugh, uh, yesterday. 2011, yep. March, under my name. I looked That's this up. Right. You see, did you see it? <laughs> I, I have it up right now. You bought two clothes that I <laughs> our silver brush center bar buckle, <laughs> half inch, and eight D rings, inch and a quarter. So the funny thing there is, I was trying to make purses, which is uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's total, well, that makes sense, right? Yeah, and it was amazing back then. I didn't, I had no idea where to get hardware. It's still, well, it's much, it's much less difficult now that I found you. But hardware had always been like a really big challenge, and. uh I was, it was amazing to find you along. I think there was only like a couple other people doing stuff online back then. Like Ohio travel bag was another one that we were trying stuff out from, but it's awesome what you guys are doing. I love it. But before we get in, I want to do a little bit of your backstory, but before we get into that, I'd really like to hear how hardware is made. It's a mystery to me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's a variety. Um, You know, we, we specialize in brass, but we do a lot of zinc and we do some stainless as well. Um, I, I could go on and on here, but I'll, I'll keep it brief and I'll keep it to brass for the moment. So brass is our specialty. Brass, we kind of consider more of an art form um, in terms of casting. You can set up a zinc casting machine and you can start pumping out zinc pretty quick. But with brass, there's a lot more that goes into it. And, and our primary way, way of making brass for a lot of our items, buckles, D-rings, swivel snaps, is sand casting. So essentially, with, with a sand casting, you have a, what's called a fada mold. You create you create initial prototypes out of, uh, out of a lost wax mold, and then you build what I call a father mold, which is essentially, uh, let's say you're making buckles, 48 buckles on this tree, and that's your father mold, and you have two halves to a sand cast, the bottom half and the top half. And what you do is you, you place the father mold, you cover it with the top half of the mold, and you release it, and you basically have this cavity. So you have this cavity, you take molten brass and you pour the brass into that cavity and it sits for about three minutes until it hardens into this sand, essentially. It's it's especially sand, low moisture sand. Um, You break it, you break it apart and you start pulling off the pieces. They go into a tumbling machine to take off the burrs. Um, You do a polishing step to to kind of fine tune some of those areas that have burrs and nicks and marks on it. Um, And then we tumble again. And from that stage, we do our plating. So with plating of brass, we do a copper layer, nickel layer, gold layer, depending on what you're made. But in in regards to solid brass, we tend to just keep it as it is. And that's kind of the beauty of brass is you can't achieve brass, um, or at least the color of brass in zinc or stainless, you can't plate to achieve that same look. And so a lot of people ask, well, we want lower pricing. We want want to achieve that brass look. Well, how do you do it? Um, it, You just use brass. Um, We have a lot of other customers that ask us, well, I want that patinaed brass. I want it to look like old brass from 40 years ago. And it's difficult. I don't know. It's almost like you want to get patinaed leather um, that's been patinaed over the course of five years, but you want to start with that. Well, that happens over time. You got to earn it. You got to earn it. Exactly. It's the same with brass. You get that patina over time. So a lot of uh, our brass is, it's all low lead. So it's, and it's uh, basically starting from this almost a high brass tone it's kind of like a new penny but in the brass color um so that so that's in a very small nutshell sand casting 
Um, that's at the core of what we do. We do a lot of forging as well. And, and you'll do forging of brass where you take, again, two halves of a, we call it a steel die cast forge. Um, and that essentially will allow you to achieve tighter shapes. Um, if you're doing a multifunctional part, like a, let's say a trigger snap, you've got springs and the, the interior pockets require certain tolerance as well. The sand casting, the tolerance isn't that fine. And so what we'll do is we'll sand cast the piece, but then we'll forge it. We'll put it into a forge mold and we'll make it more exacting turns and radiuses. And so you can fit springs in and it functions smooth. We're one of the main things we're known for, for the past four years is swivel snaps, which seems minor, but we make a pretty good swivel snap. And, and a lot of that has to do with the forging molds that we use. Um, I could go on. There's other ways. There's lost wax. There's zinc die casting. There's a variety, but but sand casting and, and forging are the two core ways we do it. Yeah, that's incredible. I had a sense uh, that everything was was, or I guess it's not all die cast. The forging is is what I wasn't anticipating. But I think what we're also interested in knowing is, you know, as a customer, the process for creation of a new design. Mm. You know that that the process of creating a new product. What is that like for somebody like me? Let's say if I had a brilliant idea for like a, a buckle. Yeah. <clears throat> so what you do is you send me, you can send me a napkin sketch, just basic, basic measurements. Um, you know, if you have radius, great, uh, but interior, in, interior dimensions, exterior. Uh, and basically I'll take your sketch and I'll send that to my team in Asia. They'll develop a 3D CAD file and a spec drawing. And so I'll send that to you. You'll approve the spec drawing. And from that, I'll print a plastic sample. Here in here in Newburyport, and so we've got a 3D plastic printer, and I'll send that to you. That takes all of four to six hours to print. You'll receive that in two days. You'll make iterations to it if you want to increase the interior dimension or the exterior, etc. You want to replace the logo or flip the logo. Easy. What we used to do is we used to do brass samples, so that would take three weeks to deliver it to you. So the, the plastic process really speeds up our sample development time. It's great. So you'll once you approve the plastic sample we will go to a brass production sample or sorry, pre-production. We'll, we'll generally make it in our CNC machine. So it's very exacting. So we always say it's going to be 90%, 98% or so the same as production. Mm -hmm. So we'll send you the finished piece in brass, um, nickel plated, gold plated, black plated, whatever you may need. You'll get that. You'll prove that and we'll open the father mold. And so if we're doing a sand casting, that will be, you know, give or take $400. If it's a swivel snap, you may be up around a thousand dollars for a mold. Um, so the sample in brass, it takes about two to three weeks. So, you know, at this point, we're about four weeks into the process, best case. You know, right. a lot of times you want to make iterations, you get a brass sample and you need to make a change to it. There's another three weeks for sampling generally. Um, once we get that approval from you on the final production piece, we go to production. We open the mold and production on a first run is usually seven to nine weeks. Um, secondary runs and, and after that tend to be six to seven weeks and yeah, we make all of our hardware at our factory in Asia. And we'll ocean ship. We bring in containers every three to four weeks, or we'll drop ship wherever you need to go or airship it if you're in a rush. So that's the quick timeline and how it works. So sounds like, if I have my timelines correct, four months from yeah, idea that, to... Yeah, yeah. COVID's kind of pushed just a little bit beyond that with production. You know, we added a week. We used to be six weeks, and then ocean was seven to eight weeks. Now ocean depends on when you hit it. Uh, but I usually say between three and four months if you're going to ocean, which I suggest. And then minimum is about a thousand pieces, give or take. Yeah, I've, I've got some stuff on a boat from you right now coming to me, uh, which is great. Uh, but, oh, but no way. Yeah, we do a lot of, well, buckle guy, right? We do a lot of the buckles from you. All, all yeah. of our hardware, with some exceptions, we are sourcing from, from you, which is because it's good product. Uh, but what I think is cool is like, People are going to listen to this. A lot of people, or some people might be hobbyists that are trying to get into leather crafting. And like I said, in 2011, it was really tough to find like a good, reliable source. That reliable is also important. I order from you because I can get it shipped the next day. Like stuff is very consistent and good. Um, but people trying to make stuff, I think hardware, maybe it's because I'm spoiled. I have like Nick across the table for me that can give me leather next door. Uh, and leather doesn't seem to be a challenge for me, but hardware is so difficult <laughs> in, my, yeah. in my mind. Uh, yeah. so no question in there, but I think maybe we can just commiserate about difficult. <laughs> I've, I've, heard, I've heard that too. I've heard, <clears throat> I think that, well, I think it's, you, you can get stuff and then it's, can you get the same thing over and over and over again? And then if you can get it, 
can you get it in the quantity that you need, especially if you're a smaller company in the beginning? And at the that, price too. Yeah. A like, thousand pieces is, is I think very reasonable, but if you're doing it on the weekends, that can be intimidating. So you're going to go get something that's, that's already in stock and you get, you guys have plenty of stuff. So I don't think that's, that's an issue, but I think that, I think that back, well, I don't know, I guess when I was trying to, when I felt like I could make, belts i was like looking around and maybe i wasn't looking in the right places but it's i think hardware is, is it can be a challenge to find um yeah well, we always stuff. i mean when we initially started in well hardware we've been doing 40 years but buckle guy really started in like 2010 or 2009 2010 um and what you find on the market a lot of times is you got your hardware store you've got your salary tack hardware you've got your marine grade hardware but that's marine grade that's salary tack grade that's hardware grade what we make is accessory grade hardware and i think kind of at the time perhaps what you were looking for was you know a step up you don't want the pits and the burrs you want the inner areas of the d-ring smooth you don't want you know rough patches and so we i guess brought to market more of an accessory grade hardware there was some stuff out there but a lot of times with other providers is they're sourcing hardware from you know five ten fifty a hundred different places so you get a you get an o-ring in antique brass and you get a d-ring in antique brass the finishes are different, but what also is different is the aesthetic. So we we try to maintain an aesthetic to our hardware of that accessory grade um, brass and leather. You know, it's not we don't do very very thin buckles. We don't do thin O rings. We do kind of heftier brass pieces. Um, and back when I when you started with us, Phil, we were I think the title on my homepage was purse hardware and handbag hardware because that's really where we started. We were we were the biggest manufacturer of brass hardware for coach um, for a decade or two. So a lot of our styles that we make, you know, kind of carry that aesthetic from the old days of coach when coach, not saying they don't make nice stuff anymore, but when they were, you know, the nice and you know, high end leather bags, you'll see that you'll go to some thrift stores and you'll see the coach bags, the old leather, black leather bags with brass. That's our brass hardware on them. And, you know, it, it's got, it's just, it's just a little bit different than your tack grade and hardware grade. Um, accessories so we'll call I, it vintage coach vintage coach say it's better or worse we'll call it vintage coach Do you, <laughs> can you can you, that's a a disease i have is when i go into a store a leather store i'm always like seeing if i can identify if our product is anywhere <laughs> i mean oh, I it, well it's not, not and i'm not it's not like i'm looking for it in places that it shouldn't be but or i wouldn't expect it to be but do you find yourself doing that too where you're like i wonder if that's, that's oh, yeah. stuff. i remember my dad when he was young i didn't really know what he did actually Actually, I thought my dad drove for Coach. Coach is a line of buses up here in the way. Right, so yeah, I, yeah. Coach was all, it must have been the topic of conversation at the table when I was a, a smaller child. Uh, so I thought my dad was a bus driver for the first like 10 to 15 years <laughs> working for Coach. But um, yeah, he, he, my dad, I remember him calling out, oh, that's the 300 or 1A or the, you know, the 1035 or the IT2375. So yeah, I mean, we'll go in and we'll kind of identify the hardware. And it's, it's pretty easy for our stuff. Uh, I don't know, Nick, with leather on, on your end, if it's if you can identify a lot of your stuff. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. pretty yeah. It's a rare occasion, honestly, though, for me. I yeah, I mean, see it's, most places. Yeah, it's generally. I mean, it used to be. Well, there used to be more, more of it out there, more, and it would you would come across it, but now it's pretty much. Do you go to stores, honestly? Like, I'm. It seems like a lot of online stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, when I can, I mean, I'll go, I mean, I, I haven't been really doing much traveling, but like if we were in like New York or something, I would, I might change my route to walk past a store and go into it. But I, yeah, yeah. It's I interesting think to you're see like, merchandise stuff. you're like self-selecting your own stuff though. Cause I think the stores you would go to would be like things that you may have already sold to. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, no, I'm not going. I mean, in that in that scenario, I'm just, I'm curious to see how stuff is being merchandised and like how it looks in the store because mm -hmm. that that informs maybe something that I can do on our on our side. But yeah, no, I'm not like I'm like oh, I wonder if this is in here. No, that would be a waste of time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can go to so many stores and there'd be nothing. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's a special. But what it's, I find it's very special to you. Yes, you go to like your country store. You know, we were in Burlington. Vermont recently and there's the country store they've got tons of different crafters from all around and you go in and you see you see your straps with our hardware I mean it, it, that's where it's kind of fun to see too it's like the local crafters that are in those towns and a lot of times I'll find our hardware there um, which is fine no, oh yeah I mean that's what that was 
my original point is that there's not a whole lot of options in the United States to get some of these leathers, hardware. It's not easy. We, we just had another guest on that is in Lyon, and uh, we were speaking with some other shoemakers this week. Oh, Curtis. I just saw it. Yeah. Yeah, we had Curtis on. Yeah, he's one of my ad- – Curtis is one of the best You know people Curtis. Ever. Oh yeah, I met Curtis. Yeah, I see, I okay. see Curtis. Yeah, he's a big yeah. deal again. <laughs> Curtis is everywhere. Well, we Curtis were talking. Is awesome. Oh man, I I met Curtis. God, the first time probably six seven years ago. It, the, uh, when he's getting started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's a personality. My brother, you know, said, "Hey, you should take a look at these guys." And I took a quick look, and I shot an email, and I think I was out there a couple of weeks later meeting Curtis and the team. Um, but he's just a great personality, just doing a great job. Um, I. I he he's somebody I really truly enjoy working with. So yeah, I, I try to get down to Leon at some point too. Um, yeah, he, he, he invited us. I would like to take he him invited, up on that. He invited you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah he, no whore wings yeah. allowed. And he invited Phil, and he's like, <laughs> yeah. "By the way, you can't." <laughs> to to that point though, he was saying, and uh, we were talking to Brett Viberg, who had been to Leon too. Mm-hmm. He said, "Oh, I saw the podcast. Leon is crazy." Was what Brett oh, was okay. describing. He said, "You walk down the street, there's a leather mall, like I thousands know. and thousands of square feet of just leather hanging up." There's a guy you walk down the street, they're selling, you know, he, he stacked he, leather heels and tools and hardware. That doesn't exist here. So there's just sort of no, like I was saying, it's in the United States, it does seem difficult to source all this stuff. Um, I think, so I think, I think that both of were, you guys, you're, I, both buy, I buy from both of you. I think, I bet there were parts of, <clears throat> of uh, New England that looked like that. I mean, maybe not as concentrated, but when the industry, when the shoe industry was there in force, I bet there was. Mm. Yeah. Was yeah, yeah all being made there Linfield, too. Lynn. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. There used to be the trade show down in South Street. Um, and South Street in Boston, I think, was the big leather town in downtown. And then outside Peabody was a big shoe area, Linfield. And that's, that's where my great grandfather started the business was in Linfield. And yeah, it was. On that note, I'm mm-hmm. I am curious to hear about the backstory of how Buckle Guy had, has come into existence, and it's my understanding that you are a generational family business in the same way that Nick and some of our other past guests are. I think that is incredible. Like if, I, mean, I think we found out that once you get to the third generation, it's like it's over. So you've made it past the hump. <laughs> my dad says he was meant to bury the business, but <laughs> <laughs> tell me how you guys got started. So we got started. So my my great grandfather. <clears throat> He moved over to England in, I believe, 1937, so perfect timing. So he was over there, and he was consulting for tanneries. And so he's going to a lot of the shoe tanneries and consulting with them on leathers and, and working to import a lot of the leathers um, into the U.S. War started, and he joined the war effort for the U.S. of sourcing leather for American-made shoes. So he was visiting a lot of the U.K. tanneries and bringing in a lot of that leather. Uh, after the war ended moved back to the U.S. in 1945, officially started IAS as more of a consulting company. It's International Advisory Service. I mean, such a nondescript name. It's a beautiful name. (laughs) (laughs) The most generic. It's so generic. And yeah, up on the wall, we've got the kind of the initial letter of starting the business. It was was a time where he had all the contacts when all communication was done by, honestly, letters and writing and typing. And so he started business in 45, had all the contacts from all the UK containers, and he was importing a ton of leather for the big shoe brands. So Alan Edmonds, Johnson & Murphy, Foot Joy, he was bringing a lot of the leather from the UK for those um, shoemakers. So that lasted quite a few years, a uh, decade or two, and uh, some of the leather tanneries started shut down, moved east, uh, as a lot of things did. We joined up with a company in Czechoslovakia that made the Melissa staking machine. So uh, do you guys, have you heard of that machine? Yeah, they used to have it. No way. I So that, we had the contract to sell them all in the U.S. Yeah, we so, had several. Did yeah. you really? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Do you still have one? I don't think, I think, I think we had like the carcass for, for a long time, but <laughs> yeah. now we don't, we don't have, we have an, we have an Italian machine now. Okay. Yeah. But it was, um, yeah, most was it like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was, a, it was a big machine and we sold that to all the U S tanneries and a lot of the European tanneries as well. So we did that for quite a while. And then we got back into leather. We represented a company out of California called Pebbity Leather. 
if you remember, those guys are no longer really around. It was Pebbity and they were agents for a few tanneries and we worked as an agent for them for quite a few years. And that was around the time that my father got involved in the business back in the early 80s. Uh, we were kind of leather agents again. And we we were selling leather out of Linfield. That was our main office. And my grandfather had a good contact down in Connecticut um, doing a lot of bags. He just kind of started out his business around early late 70s early 80s i believe and do, ton of leather so it was a big leather contract for us my grandfather at the time had just got in contact with a company out of taiwan uh, the the wu family and he got hardware samples from them they they ran on they ran a they ran a hardware factory out of taiwan and he showed this client down in connecticut um obviously leathers but he said hey in the back of the car i've got hardware and so he opened the trunk of the car and he had a couple cards of hardware and one of them was our 59 little swivel snap and he said, oh, yeah, I use these. He says, yeah, I do about 50,000 of these a month, which wow. light bulb went off. And that was that was my father kind of came down there shortly after. And I say overnight, but over the next year or two, we slowly transitioned out of leather because leather, especially as an agent, was, I mean, you're talking two, three percent margins mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, that was, you know, those years were pretty slim um, at IAS. And so you that's know, not enough. For you, we're still, we're, still, we're still doing that. <laughs> yeah. So my dad was, you know, he he swore he'd never sell leather again. Here we are, you know, in twenty twenty. Smart uh, decision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's a brilliant guy. <laughs> so we still have some old leathers from all over the place up on the skids at the office. So yeah, I mean, over the next couple of years, we quickly transitioned to representing this company out of Taiwan. That brought us to the '90s. Kind of slowly got out of leather, and we opened it up. We opened our factory with the same family in 2000. At the time, we we had a couple of big contracts. Um, Coach being one of them, and selling a ton of hardware. And so, started that in 2000. And my father began it with the the family, and we've been doing it ever since. And so, you know, in 2010. You know, Coach was slowly fading away. They they were moving their factories outside of China, and so we wait. Were they in Massachusetts before? Well, our our factory, no, our factory was in Taiwan for the first work. I'm, I'm we were, sorry. Was was Coach producing near your factory? Is it? it what are you no, doing? I think they were making in Asia at the time. Maybe they were making some. Nick, you may know better, or Phil, you may know better. I I don't know at the time back in the '80s where they were making. I assume it was overseas, but maybe it was domestic. I, I, I don't know. I'm I sure think it was. Had... I think it was overseas, just based on stories that I've heard. I, I can't. I can't say for certain though where. I'm not trying to take us off the rails, but I was curious. It, it, you were saying that we moved our stuff from. It sounded like you were moving stuff from your local uh, so, Massachusetts location to Asia. Sorry, no. So we were we were drop shipping. I believe within Asia at the time, probably within China. A lot of their production was in China, but in the mid to that, well, 2015 or so, 2016. Um, we, I think, when did I get involved in the business? I think around that time, about 10 years ago, so 2013, they were, they, we, they were basically gone. They wanted to get out of China. They wanted to move to Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and they wanted just essentially get out of China at the time. So they did. And that's when they started to go away. And we ended up having a ton of hardware on our floor, a small little warehouse um, in Topsfield, Mass. And we were stuck with it essentially. And so at the time, my dad said, well, what are we going to do with it? Let's make a little website. So we put up, you know, probably 50, 100, 150 items on the website and we started to sell them. And so I got involved a, a year or two later and, you know, we discovered, hey, there's this huge market of U.S. on-demand crafters, manufacturers, bigger manufacturers that they can't wait three months. They, they need it immediately and consistency and accessory grade hardware. And so, you know, the next couple of years, we started to gain traction discovered, yeah, there's a market in the U.S. We don't have to sell the big brands anymore. Or we still do, but, you know, there's a market of smaller makers that you know, need this. That was kind of around the time that U.S. made movement yep. really was hitting strong. Um, the financial crisis, I believe, was the start of that. And uh, Nick had seen a similar, when I was working there, we saw a similar uptick in, you know, interest in Nick's products. Yeah, coming out okay. of the financial. Yeah. Like coming like 09. Mm -hmm. 10 yeah yeah what do you what do you I mean people who who were your buyers at that time what who was the buyer uptick would you say made in usa brands for us shinola was around yeah, yeah i mean yeah. it was it was i mean there was like we talked about this before but like there was a big boat shoe like a hand-sewn uptick at that point 
Okay. And I just think Quaddy it was... Quaddy ran court. Yeah. I'm name yeah. dropping, man. Do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that... I think that it was because people hadn't been spending money and then they started to sort of need stuff or want to spend some money again. And then they were doing a bunch of research on what they should be spending their money on. Should, you know, should being a word not supposed to use, but... Um, yeah, and then that, I think that led people to doing research, which is when like the forum sort of mm, world yeah. took off, like Ask Andy and Style Forum, and like then like the like the streetwear like hype beast and like all that stuff. Like those all seem to be getting a lot of traffic, and then that's just people were just looking for information. So I think that's that's what helped. And they in developed. my mind, that's what helped the USA made thing at least at that point. And then it was it was sort of intersecting with that the boat shoe cycle which we mm-hmm. talk about but you know they come in it's and coming out of, back yeah. you it's a, we're in an uptick yeah the boat shoes, boat shoes never left new england I mean, no no they don't leave but they sort of they become okay. it's like you know, it's like any, everything else like loafers and sneakers yeah. and leather and non-leather it's just like you know it goes it's all cycle yeah i was projecting before we spoke you because i was under the impression with those four generations it sounded like we start with leather machines for generation one we moved to leather generation two. We moved to hardware generation three. I thought you may have been the catalyst for online uh, direct to consumer, but uh, it was your dad. Yeah, yeah, I give, <laughs> I give him credit. Yeah, he put up a site. My mom took all the photos. Uh, my grandfather and my mom at the time were the only ones picking and packing the orders. Uh, you know, my aunt, who's still there, uh, still with us today, is the accountant. So you know, we were we're a small little family shop at the time. That that was how we got it all started. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got involved about a year, probably a year later. I started doing some contract, say contract work. I I st- after school, I started an online business, so like digital marketing and website development and that sort of thing. So I did that for about three years, and then. Yeah, I decided to come into the family business. I think I think maybe on one of your earlier podcasts, you talked about this need for physical items. And that, at the time, I, you know, I love the digital space. I spent most of my time there, but I wanted that physical product, something tangible that I, I could see moving. And I that was a big, obviously, the family business, but I, I wanted something, like I said, more physical. And so I got involved and I had the background in digital. And so, yeah, I started to push a lot of the, Buckle Guy products development and so forth. So yeah, I, I I came at a good time, right when it was pretty green and, and helped to push it. Yeah. How much? Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable answering this, but how much <laughs> larger is it today? Serving those consumers directly, or you know, smaller brands like myself directly, is it, is it much larger than it was because of the web store? Do you mean our business in general? Or yeah, like mean- volume of product out the door. So we, we consider our, our business kind of two-sided. We've got IAS and we've got Buckle Guy. IAS is factory direct. You're making custom hardware and we're making that for you. And then we've got Buckle Guy, which is everything that we stock here in Newburyport. So, you know, prior to Buckle Guy, it was all IAS. It was all, we didn't touch hardware. A lot of our stuff is drop shipped around the world as it still is today for those IAS clients. So, you know, back in the days of Coach, I mean, the volume was absolutely massive. Mm. Massive, massive, but, you know, slim margins, so today, you know, with Buckle Guy, we have we have price breaks, we have different pricing structure. We bring it in, we stock it, we have more personnel here. So there's, it's a higher price product for Buckle Guy. So it was, it's been this balance because we put so much effort into Buckle Guy, but we need to provide the volume to the factory in order to stay afloat. So we have to maintain a bit of a balance of making sure that we have your your brands, your domestic brands, international brands that are doing the volume, but then. Kind of, being able to also cater and increase your product line to Buckle Guy and the offerings that we put there. But the, mar- the, the volumes just in general aren't as big. You know, we can get a big contract with some of the brands that you've mentioned to work with. And, you know, that could be a big portion of our production. But in terms of size, we've certainly grown. I mean, we've grown Buckle Guy's significantly bigger than it was years ago. I mean, we had one vendor that was our factory. Now we've got close to 100 vendors. Um, but we systematically choose who we go with. Sometimes it takes long. You know, we represent Riri. We represent, I mean, we stock Orwin. I mean, you know, we, we try to stock brands that put the same amount of care, attention, quality into what they're doing and to what we consider we're doing with our hardware. So we try to maintain a high level of supply. We're a little more expensive. You're going to pay a little bit more, but I believe there's a reason for that with what we do. Mm-hmm. What we- Have you thought about trying to make anywhere, any hardware <clears throat> domestically again? We've been asked, it's it's pretty difficult. And, and one of the main barriers is the EPA. 
we we meet and exceed a lot of the regulations in Asia because we're foreign owned. So if we do one thing wrong, they'll shut us down tomorrow. So we we go above and beyond in terms of what we do. But starting a factory domestically here, water treatment facility that we put up in Asia was we put three in in the past. 15 years and each of them is they're like a half a million to a million dollar water treatment facilities i think to do wow. that here in the US, you're probably talking five million you know let alone the factory you know there's a bit of labor that goes into it i mean labor costs would probably not allow us to do it we have a lot of interest it's like we have a lot of interest in copper harbor people talk about it but then nobody ever buys it <laughs> you know i think if we were to sell a buckle that we do now say a buckle at five bucks if we did it domestically you'd be talking 15 dollars. it's 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 not it's not possible. I've entertained the idea, but to do brass sandcast level of quality that we do, it's 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 just not possible. Mm, bummer. Anyway, so I actually was wanting to ask earlier. You do a lot of brass, and the question is why brass? And then the second question there, when you mentioned copper, isn't copper a bit soft? Uh, is there a way to harden that copper? Yeah. Sorry. When I say copper, I mean copper plating. Okay. So copper, copper brass. Um, yeah, we do, we do a lot of zinc. I mean, some years, half of our production is in zinc and that's because the higher volume, you know, you're ordering a hundred, 200,000 units and you need to meet a price while you're doing zinc. I mean, I, I would say, you know, Nick, what, or, or Phil, what would you say the percentage of leather goods in the U S use chrome tan versus let's say vegetable? If all you had leather a, goods, huh? That's yeah. All leather goods that you just, can buy. In, just here or in general? In in the U.S., in say the accessory bag market, small accessory market, I'd go ninety nine percent would be would be chrome. Mine. Yeah, probably. I mean, not maybe not that high, but it's got to be nine in the Most. nine ninety per, in the ninety percent range. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I, I would say the same is true of hardware. Now, there's a, a bigger distinction. You know, you can get just as good quality. There's different reasons for using for using yours, but for brass and zinc, brass is significantly higher. And so I would say 95, 97% of hardware is zinc. And so we can make a buckle in brass and let's say it's three bucks. Well, zinc, I could probably make it in 60 cents, give or take, probably less. So it, it's definitely price point driven, but there's a lot of benefits that come to brass. Their strength is probably the number one component. Um, you know, brass is significantly stronger than zinc. It, it bends before it breaks. It holds its structure. Um, uh, the tensile strength, so your pull strength, is significantly higher on brass. It's it's a better material for that reason. It plates better. It holds the plating better. Um, when we run through a production run in our factory, you know, our our yield, let's say, is ninety percent. So that ten percent, we're going to throw back into the pot, remelt it, and reuse it. With zinc, you can't do that. We have to throw it out. It changes the properties, and so at least for the hardware that we're making. Um, you know, brass, you can't achieve the brass look. You can't achieve the antique brass look. Antique brass is made by staining natural brass to a, almost a black color. And then you tumble it off. You tumble off that antique brass layer. If you want a light antique brass and dark antique brass, um, it just depends on how many hours it goes in the tumbling machine for. So people want zinc with a brass finish. Well, you can't get that. You're only going to get that if you do brass. And, you know, brass has that, it's, it's got the appeal over the generations as well. It just it goes better with leather. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking, if you're talking IAS, so you're talking factory direct to businesses, what percentage of that is solid brass versus everything else? I would probably say this as of this year, I would say 70% of zinc on the IAS side. We do some big volumes on zinc because of the price. Yeah, no, it makes it make it it totally lines up with the product life cycle conversation that we seem to have here a lot where it's not and it's not, I mean, it's just the reality of the world. I think it's not, it's not, I'm not saying anything about your company, but I mean, people, pe the people, the, maybe some of the bags or products that that stuff is going on, people are not looking for something that's going to last 20 years. I mean, if it looks yeah. great for two years, I mean, that's fine. So the 60 cent versus $3 buckle, that's not a big differentiation point for the customer. So then the, the, the whoever is yeah. making the bag isn't really going to be. Yeah, you made a point in your maker podcast where you, you said, you know, it goes in the landfill, right? You get two, two, three uses out of it. Well, they end up burning 30% of their overstock, but they made profit. I think that was on your podcast. Yep. And, you know, I thought that was a great point. Or maybe you're talking about jeans. Well, what's the, what's the dollar cost for wear? I think that's a great point. It's the same with hardware and bags in general. You go to the airport and you see a broken swivel where they've now hooked the swivel snap to, you know, some piece of fabric because the D-ring broke or something. That's generally because it's zinc. So you pay for what you get. 
which I think is, which speaks to our buckle guy uh, customer base. These are, you know, generally smaller, when I say small, you know, 30, 40 people at most for most of our clients, most are one, two, three person shops. I'm going to guess your buckle guy business is, is, is the opposite percentage. Mm. It, oh, absolutely. Oh, if not more, if not yeah. 90, because we only really stock brass, but right. that's because there are other people that make zinc. We want to be a little bit different, but we also want to maintain that high end appeal of what we do. We could easily stock a lot of zinc and cut our prices by two thirds, but we want to maintain brass. We don't want to overstock ourselves um, in a lower quality material. Um, but a lot of our, the clients, like they, they just like you're selling your leathers into people because they care, they care about the materials that go into their product. And that's why we believe we've had great successes because we work, we're working with clients that care about materials. I mean, if, if what I really appreciate about what you're saying is how exact, uh, exactly you've identified me as a customer, everything you've said. And, and we, I saw you sent an email yesterday of some stuff we could talk about. You had a note about, Hey, we, we've, heard from our customers that it's it's difficult to source thread consistently over and over like that is a thing like i felt like i had told you that but you're hearing it from people i like that you're listening to customers <laughs> i do want to get into that but before i hop there i was i was curious as to why you were asking about chrome tan versus veg because i, I saw that you may have been trying to connect an analogy of like zinc is to brass as chrome is to veg i don't necessarily I would- think that's a fair like even close to uh, not at all and that's why i kind of doubled back and, and i said you know it's a different distinction between brass and zinc mm. between edge and, and chrome absolutely and i maybe i didn't say this but i was thinking it you can achieve a much better chrome tan leather than you can on certain veg tan leathers there's not a better or worse in that scenario in my opinion right depending on use but a lot of times what a lot of clients will do like i was going to say michael kors they're going to go to the factory and say well make me this bag at 17 dollars and 62 right. cents Figure I'm out. out of the conversation already. Nick, you're probably out of the conversation already. Completely. We don't, we don't, that used to be our, our bread and butter. Was I was out when you said the brand name though. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be great. It'd be massive volumes, but, but we don't, that is no longer who we work with. That's, you know, we buckle guy, we've got, you know, a great client base. And then on the IS side, we work with, I won't say any names there, but you know, some bigger shops, but, they care about the materials. We work with the designers and, and the, the makers um, at those bigger brands. We don't work with the factories that then make for brands. We're, we don't have the backdoor deals like a lot of these, you know, domestic Asian suppliers do. We don't, we don't make a cheap, cheap, cheap product. That's just, that's not us. We could probably go, I don't know how much you guys want to go on leather. And Nick is sometimes concerned that we talk about his material. Too no, much. I just, I like, I want, <clears throat> I don't know because I think sometimes we, we end up talking about our product specifically. Like I guess you just what you're saying. I mean, it's our experience. Yeah, but but I like to I like to hear about other stuff because well, I, I think we talk about that plenty. I think there's like a I don't know if it's a misconception by most people, but I could see it being very confusing when somebody says Chrome Excel. That's a Chrome tan leather, therefore it is the same as every Chrome tan leather. I think there's a huge topic there that we should do a podcast on, just talking about like. You don't just because something chrome tan, chrome tanned. Guess what? You can chrome tan. That formulation of chrome tanning can be many different versions. So not even just the tannage, let alone the retannage. It's just like such a disparate amount of options that it's a tree are not it, even comparable. It's a tree. It starts out at one point and then it branches out quickly, really quickly. So like when somebody asks me like, "Hey, what's better, chrome or veg?" To your point, Hugh, it's what are you doing? And like that is such. It's like, what's better, a car or a truck? Yeah, <laughs> like, right. what are you talking about? Yeah. No, there's and, and there's there. certain items in zinc too that you can only make in zinc, and we we will recommend. Well, if you're making this style of turn lock, it's zinc. Zinc is going to make a better item than brass. Brass is going to be first of all way too expensive for one reason, but you're able to achieve some different things in zinc. So we'll recommend that in certain scenarios as well. I want to hop over to the before we get into your new. I want to talk about the stuff in your email here. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I want to. I yeah. really want to do that too. But so going back through the four generations in the history of the, we're doing we're doing leather machines, we're doing leather, we're doing hardware, we're doing it online. Now you're introducing over. I think it's been a decade or so since you've started to sell leather directly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How difficult is it to sell leather and to source all that material? And what's it? What's that? How is that doing for you guys as a business? 
We, so well, leather's a great component. We've, I mean, a lot of our warehouse is now taken up by leather. Um, but we are, our philosophy was, again, kind of in line with our hardware is we want to stock the best, um, what people want compared to the hardware that we stock. But we generally stock, you know, from a lot of the tanners, ones and twos. So grades one and two. A lot of the time, we don't want to necessarily deal with threes. We don't want to job some of the threes out. I know there's a great market for it. If you know what you're doing, a lot of times, yes, you can take a three grade or, or lower boneyard grade and you can, you know, find a yield and, and make it worth the price. But initially, when we started, we're a slim team. You know, I started customer service. I was the only customer service for the first three years. We're pretty small and lean. And so to deal with all the customers that are buying leather that might be the first skin of leather they've ever bought and they see that tick bite. I I don't want to deal with all those customers that are complaining about threes because they don't know what they're looking at. And that's a big part of our client base is, is people that are just getting into it. So that was a big reason why we started ones and twos, which I think in essence makes it easier to sell leather is because we're, we're buying, you know, the least imperfection and having the least amount of concern. So um, that has made it easier. Um, you know, during COVID it was tough with, with deliveries, but I don't know. It hasn't been too difficult. A lot of the the other thing that I wanted to start with, I should go back to, is when we first started selling leather, we started with Sedgwick out of England. I think that was one of our first. We started selling Herman Oak straps, straps only. Gosh, probably almost nine years ago. And then we got I got in touch with Wicket on a business meeting out in Seattle um, at a lunch, just randomly, and got talking to Matt Bressler over there that you know, runs kind of the sales department. He's a great guy. And hooked up with him, hooked up with you, Nick, through Phil. Phil, you missed it, but I read the email that I actually spoke to you, who, and then you put me in touch. I was with like, Nick. "Yo, you should sell Nick's leather." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which was great. And, and so early on, I wanted to establish ourselves in selling leather and being a leather craft store with with stol- solid brand names behind us: Wicked and, and Horween and Herman Oak and Sedgwick's. And so that was kind of the initial start. So in that, a lot of customers knew who we were stocking, what to expect. And we were stocking ones and two. So people were happy with it. We shipped in 24 hours. So I don't know. I, I know a lot of people have a lot of issues. My dad did years and years ago, selling leather. He just said he would never do it again. Um, here we are. But <laughs> I haven't found it to be too difficult. The education on the um, on our staff side it takes a little while. There's a, there's a learning curve there because we've got, you know, we've got a couple of those knife cutters, those oscillating knife cutters. Um, and so we do a lot of panel cutting and to educate them to what to avoid, what to, you know, what to get. And same with straps where you're blocking the, the sides of leather. That, that honestly takes more of my time than actually dealing with customers. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the right way to do it. I mean, if you send a better product, you won't have poor, uh, you won't have customers that even want to contact you. The stuff's great. I'm just going to make my product and have a yeah. good day. Uh, the leathers, um, in the similar way to stocking hardware being difficult, you have so many different skews of hardware and different finishes, which must be an incredible challenge and an incredible warehouse to to see just the amount of stuff you have. Yeah, a lot. And the leathers is, I would imagine, even more difficult just because there's grades to it. And then, say you wanted to stock five different colors of chrome excel from nick like yeah. that's a that's a lot of money to sit on and you have to buy a large uh, full run of it and then stock it that's a pretty big capital uh, move like to to put all that up front and then sell it off piece by piece but i do think in the same way that the hardware is a great value add for your customers that the leather is good too it's um, great yeah and we try to keep it you know again we are a wholesale manufacturer so i try to be pretty fair and aggressive on pricing as well. And so I try to price items out on leather where it's accessible to both the crafter and the manufacturer. Yes, probably a little bit, obviously more expensive than if you go directly to you on larger volumes. But generally speaking, I think we're pretty good on price. And then in terms of, yeah, the cash load and the cash flow that we have, yeah, we spend a good amount of stock because what we do is I like to buy, I think, gosh, the amount of SKUs I have with you guys, Nick, I think I buy six or seven of your chrome excel that i cut down to panels and straps you should see your you should see the horror strap wall it's huge and then same with cavalier dublin essex we stock all of those but we buy everything at weight so rather than buying your heavyweight and dry splitting it down where we could buy one skew 
and let's say I would buy a hundred skins of your heavy weight. Well, no, I end up buying 40 skins of your two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five, five and a half, six, seven to eight, eight, nine. So yes, but I, I stock and it comes right in, goes right out. I don't have to deal with splitting it down. It's better that way. We need and to talk I, about that. Question, yeah. Could you, this is a big question. I still don't really have an answer to dry splitting versus wet splitting. What does that do to the integrity of the leather? Great question. I got to go. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me uh, clarify terms. Dry splitting, wet splitting is exactly how it sounds. You can split a piece of leather, uh, either a whole hide or a side, or even um, cut panels. You can thin down those pieces in a process called splitting in a in the wet department at the tannery, or after the leather has already been tanned and dried and finished. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so there's <clears throat> there's splitting prior to retannage, so after the base tannage. So for the case of chrome excel, it's chrome tan. So you would split it when it's wet blue. So everything gets split at that stage because the hides come in and there the weights are not consistent. So we have to we have to you know we look at a hide and it sort of has a natural weight to it, and then there's a lowest common denominator in the hide too. So we figure out whatever that is. It's generally like in the belly area. Um, and then we'll split down to that weight. And then that's sort of the, that's sort of the, we can go lighter, but that's sort of the base weight. And then there's a bunch of reasons to keep things, if they're heavy, to keep things heavy. I mean, one of them is price because the heavier hides are more expensive. So to, for you, for you to buy all, you know, 10 ounce and then split down to five ounce, it's be more expensive. And just, in, just in terms of this cost for you for labor, but also the footage price, because we charge more for the heavier hides because, well, there's, there are production reasons because we do everything by weight, by not by thickness weight, but by pounds weight. So when we're doing retanning, we're retanning based on how many skins we can get into a drum. So the more, that. if we can get more in there based on them being thinner, then we're spreading that labor cost out over, you know, of that, over that, of that run over more footage. So that's, that's the primary driver for the heavyweight stuff that will, that and the, and the price of the raw material itself. But but the, the, so yeah, so when you're splitting in the blue, you're sort of, you're taking it sort of more, at least the way we do it, taking it more towards, to its natural weight and then going from there. And then we're, we're ordering hide thicknesses by average weight based on out of focus. Oh. We're ordering. This camera we have on, in the, in the room here, Hugh, is the other one here is like breathing focus yeah. over and over. So, so this, this is going to be like. a terrible video, but whatever. <laughs> it's just Nick. Yeah. Um, where was I? We should talk about the strength of. Yeah, I, I'm getting there. Yeah. So if you were, so the, what was, I don't remember the last thing I said. You're going to have to stitch this together, Phil. <laughs> Good luck editing this. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, the, the heavier weight. Are you talking about keeping it as, as natural? Yeah, we weight want to as keep possible? it as yeah, because then that's that's there's a. I mean, we're sure. from the jump at industry of byproducts, so buying something that's thick and then splitting, taking a huge split off of it, um, creates a bypro another byproduct, which in that case was a drop split, which we can sell by the pound if they're thick enough. But that's that's it's not that's not a, a money maker for us. So that's something that we're we would be buying and then we'd be it, it's there's it's inefficient and a waste of. A potential, you don't want to profit create that center, right? Um, so splitting when it's dry is you know, you're taking something that's already sort of at its natural weight because that's how we've got it to that point, and then to split you know three ounces off of it, you're taking. I mean, that's structural stuff that's part of the leather. So you you start to compromise strength. So anything we sort of our rule of thumb is is that if you're taking off more than an ounce, then you probably should be using a different weight. You should be starting with a lighter weight. Um, and there are exceptions. Like if you're doing wallets or certain applications, you can split something very light, especially if you're going to back it with something to give, give it that strength back. But, um, but yeah, so we, we, and we do dry split um, Chrome Excel specifically in this example, because when we air dry it, it shrinks and gains weight unevenly. So we have to, I split it so to even the weight out again, but that is not. I mean, we're taking it's you know half ounce. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, and that's not even a byproduct. You can tell. It looks, no, it's garbage. It looks yeah, like it trash. looks. Like, it's like paper. It tears like paper because it's just. Yeah. 
if you've got, let's say you've got a heavy wet blue at 12 ounce and, and you're going to, and let's say at the end, I want a two and a half ounce. Well, you shouldn't really be starting with a 12 ounce wet blue. Then, Never. Right? No, you waste money right. and you just, I call it like sweeping the leg. <laughs> <laughs> so like the substance of the leather, the material is a f- network of fibers starting right. with the green layer on the top to the backside, which is known as the flesh. And when you thin down the leather that far from 12 to two, that's absurd. So you're, you're literally like taking out the foundation of your house and you're just left with the roof. So there's nothing to hold all that together for your strength. Right. And where I see a big problem, the reason I'm a business, same as you listen to your customers, I have people come in and say, my, my wallet exploded and something they got at a big box store or who knows where. And what happens is the, I see it all the time on a turned edge, whoever created that product thinned down the leather to give it a really beautiful, refined look, maybe backed it with something. But even on the turns, you certainly see it in the corners, that leather has nothing to hold it together. It just it literally explodes just from rubbing in your pocket. So people will wear a wallet for a couple of months if it has a skive down maybe too far and turned edge. Uh, you really see the leather strength um, being compromised by taking out all the substance underneath it. So I think where you may have been going with this, Hugh, though, is... You know, if splitting the leather reduces the strength of that network of fibers, like why would you split it at all in the blue? Yeah, because the weight's uneven. You, the tw- if you if you yeah if you yeah. want a twelve ounce finished weight and you're not, I mean, the retanning influences that a lot. But you might be starting with something that's fifteen or sixteen ounces to in order to achieve a twelve ounce belly, just the way they mm-hmm. the way they are. So, and then the other, you know, the, I said it a little bit before, but if you're a 12 to get something that's that will yield you 12 ounces. I mean, that might be an $80 hide and to get you something that's going to yield you two ounces. That might be a like $10 hide, right? $8 or $9. So the, the, I mean, it's, there's a gigantic price difference um, okay. in there. And it, it, you were saying is that the t- you've got the top grain and then is the corium in the center mm-hmm. and your flesh. And so proportionally, if you're working with a smaller wet blue, I'm assuming proportionally you've got a thinner top grain, thinner corium and it's it's somewhat correlated between the thicknesses from a lightweight to a heavyweight and so when you're splitting something like 12 ounce down to two and a half ounce you're basically left with a thin layer top grain whereas when you're splitting something at say five ounce and it was made to be five ounce you're probably keeping some of that corium if you split it from a five ounce down to two and a half ounce does that make sense it's a good point i think i don't think it's i think it's variable i think it's more i think it's harder to standardize than that based on the animal and how it was raised and where it was raised and the time of year. I think a lot of those things influence that. Okay. Um, it'd be yeah. interesting. I don't, I can't, I couldn't tell you like, well, hides in North America have thicker. It's hard. It's hard. For, for my experience, so it feels like the grain layer on, regardless of inherent weight is consistent. The grain always, that little layer on top doesn't seem to like fluctuate in, in any like measurable thickness as far as I can tell. From, well, from, High type to high type, it does. But mm. I think, like, if you're just looking at all steers, I think right. it's pretty. It's relatively consistent. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the real reason I'm asking is we stock every weight at weight, and we don't split. Mm. So, you know, like I said, we have a lot more inventory than we would if we went the other other way. And and one of the reasons that we thought a benefit of doing that was because we don't split, and therefore you're getting it at the tanned weight, and you're getting a, a a stronger, I guess, piece of leather as opposed to us taking it and splitting it down. Now, we we do take one leather that we we purchase and we split it down and we end up with a split. Um, but I don't know. I, I think we'll continue to do it the way that we're doing. John uh, Cullen, you know, he, I think he tells us that at the tannery at, at Horween, you guys will make a lot of like your Essex and Dublin that we get and we buy it in eight, nine, and then we buy it in three and a half, four, four and a half, five, and I think five and a half, six. Everything in the lower three sizes are tanned at the same weight, and then you split those down. But the eight nine is tanned at that weight, or a heavier weight, and split to that. And you don't you don't take what you've made from the eight nine and make and use that same hide for right. things lighter. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, that's that's right. That's okay. right. I mean, because it's the the lower the thinner weights are all coming from the same hide source, more or less the same starting weight. I mean, there'll be different when we get a truckload. There are different weights because it's an average weight. But those are all sort of the same group, and then the eight nine is as a separate group. 
Yeah. Um, you may also notice, Hugh, on the heavier weights, even okay. if you were to run them in the same drum as the lighter weights, you'll notice that the heavier weights are much different than the lighter weights in terms oh, yeah. of every every characteristic. Oh, yeah. The fat wrinkles that we see. I'm fat wrinkles, even the color. like. Oh, yeah. The take-up of the dyes is different because there's more substance to tan. It's, no, the run times are different, too. It's interesting, like nobody would ever know these things unless you worked at the tannery. It's just like so, just the thickness and the runs and the amount of stuff you put in a drum, it, it all affects everything. So to the um, to the challenge of a tannery, it's pretty incredible to think about Nick is taking a truckload of infinitely variable hides. Of different every time, yeah. And making it the same way every time. It, and your dad calls it a magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's pretty it's pretty awesome what, what you guys do and uh, honestly i miss working over there so i'm going to shed a tear for myself we got uh, some, <laughs> you want to run a coloring mill we got some job yeah. <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> ass job i'll tell you that all right hugh i want to get to some of your stuff so we talked about the past generations and, and your current fourth generation here moving forward where do you see things going you got new products coming out um what are you guys working yeah, on I mean, yeah, we've got a couple of things. Well, I, I should mention my brother's also joined business um, six, seven years ago, but he kind of has an offshoot. And so he actually runs a manufacturing facility, a finished goods manufacturing. Uh, so he's got a, a bunch of people on his team and they make the products for a lot of the brands that we've spoken about. So um, we do have a finished goods department as well, where we'll take Fort Wayne and a variety of other leathers and, and make the finished product, make bags, belts, um, et what, what's, so the, what's the name of that brand? Uh, his brand to. name is called Totter, uh, Totter USA. So he could you spell yeah, that, please? P O D D E R. His, his name is Ted, but it's a con common misconception. It goes by Todd. Totter. <laughs> Totter. Um, so yeah, we we have that area of the business now. So we're doing some finished goods manufacturing. So that's going well. It, the future, you know, we're trying to expand. We've added, like I said, a ton of new vendors, a ton of other products outside of just hardware. And, and like I said, we, we're trying to maintain that higher level of quality. So again, we stock Riri zippers, you know, the Ferrari zipper in the market. We stock Horween and um, we just brought in intercom glue. It can go on. A lot of the tanneries that we stock are well known. What I'm trying, the philosophy I'm trying to take now is trying to add some newness to the market, something that's a little bit novel and, and not just taking something from a catalog and restocking it on our site. We still, we'll, you know, we'll do some of that, but we're trying to be somewhat unique and thoughtful about what we're bringing to market to add value to the industry. You know, we're trying to bring in hardware that's, you know, standard. A lot of our hardware is traditional hardware. It's going to be around today. It's going to be around in 40 years. We don't chase trends because we don't want to be stuck with it, but that's not really our game. So, in regards to newness in the future, we're definitely going to be continuing to increase our line of hardware. We work on that every week in terms of new product development, um, tools and tooling, leathers. We're, we're adding. It takes a while sometimes because we somewhat careful and you know want to make sure we work with good people, but also bringing in you know the right products. So the future is going to be continuing to do what we're doing and hopefully do it better and bigger. That's mm -hmm. that's the goal and, and trying to listen to our customers and bringing in the right products. So yeah. Tell me about the, uh, I saw that the thread announcement that you, you or at least maybe you just announced it, <laughs> it just to me. Um, yeah, it's not, we're working on, we're working on photo, literally photos before the call. Um, we're bringing on, yeah, thread, sewing thread. It's nylon 6.6, which I know way more about now than I ever did. And that's kind of the, that's, that's the thread you want to use if you're in leather goods and leather working manufacturing, upholstery, car upholstery, um, furniture, et cetera. Why? Uh, we do a bonded nylon 69 and like 138s for like heavier stuff, but what's the 6.6? Oh, yeah. six, six? The 6.6 six is basically you're adding another layer of, it's like a resin um, coating to the thread. Um, and essentially you're getting slightly smoother, slightly shinier thread um, than your standard nylon. Um, so it's it's a bit of a step up. Outside of the U.S., 99% of threads are standard nylon. But in, in the U.S., there's a, a vast majority that use the nylon 6.6. So it's mostly a U.S.-based nylon, right, going with the 6.6. It's slightly higher end. Um, 
what my brother Ted, you know, has mentioned to us over the years is it is so difficult to find thread, which I just find bizarre, you know, sewing thread, there's so many industries. Sewing is probably 10 times the size of leather crafts, if not a hundred times the size of leather craft. So I'm surprised, but I think it has to do with the, 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 your tech size, as you mentioned, the 69, the 70, the 90, the 138 um, is really for more aggressive, high friction environments like leather and canvas. And so we're bringing in 25 colors in those three tech sizes um, out of a company out of India, which is the hub of all textile manufacturing. And so it's they're they actually supply to the majority of U.S. car makers to a lot of the U.S. upholstery makers. And so we're bringing it in at a pretty good price. I think that's kind of the goal here. Um, and consistency, consistency and reliability. So that's, that's I, I would love to be a customer for that. And maybe, maybe I can send you some of the stuff I'm using to see if you have something similar. Cause the consistency, you're absolutely right. We use a color called rust. Well, it was called rust. Now it's okay. Chinese rust. And I'm sure next month it will be Japanese rust. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's all over the place, man. Uh, something that's interesting. I, I, you may want to be aware of from a crafting workshop sort of perspective is on those resin coated threads i'm not certain if i'm i don't know what you're using and I, I don't know if it's similar to what i was doing we were noticing some of that resin coated stuff is a little bit more brittle which doesn't sound necessarily bad because you're you know sort of weaving it and stitching things together with it so it doesn't seem like brittleness would be a factor but what we noticed was in the back stitching uh, or back tacking sort of stitch that sometimes those more brittle threads were more easily punctured with the needles and we tried different needles, but we ended up having um, frayed stitches and customers being upset because of some of that. So just a word of caution there. I, I don't know if it's we suck or if it's that, but we moved away from some of those things. Um, so one of the big issues my brother had was similar to that, fraying, breaking, brittleness. And a lot of that has to do with the shelf life. So a lot of threads that he was buying, he would buy, you know, a rust that was made in, in 2015. He just got a batch in that was made in 2015 and, and earlier. He's got some on the floor from 2012. And so I think that's one of the issues with supplying or sourcing thread now in the U.S. If you're only looking for a couple of rolls is you might be getting thread from 10 years ago and there's going to be some color fade to it. The Nylon 66 is UV resistant, but I'm sure there's going to be slight discoloration over 10, 12 years at the time. And especially if you're buying rust and you're getting a 12, 2010 batch versus a 2023 batch, you're going to have a color change. Mm -hmm. That was his problem. And he blamed a lot of the brittleness on the age of threads. Wow. I didn't consider that. Are there threads that don't have a shelf life like that? Is there something that lat like the shelf life? And I'm not speaking about color, just about strength, about something that I lasts longer i'm not sure i yeah. i'm not sure really what the shelf life is because you, you you think well i'm gonna make a bag and i'm getting a lifetime guarantee i expect a lifetime guarantee on the thread it shouldn't disintegrate in 10 years and that i don't think that's the case i think probably in that high stress sewing going through leather environment like your back stitching that perhaps the, the heat i know that nylon and nylon 66 with that resin coating has a higher heat tolerance so the mm. friction that it's creating is a higher heat tolerance Maybe some of that re resin kind of evaporates to a degree. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting question with the with the shelf life. I had not considered that, but that makes that could make sense. Although it's plastic, so it's hard to know. I don't really understand. I know. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know. It's yeah. just such small fibers, though. <clears throat> Phil always gives me a hard time because I clear my throat. Your throat, throat, throat dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm yeah. currently Hugh. I'm currently buying thread from um, the Thread Exchange, which you may have heard of. of and yep. I want to have him on here to explain thread. And this would be a good. Oh question, gosh, well he'll he'll probably tell me I have said everything wrong. I'm well, sure. I don't know. You might be completely right. <laughs> no, I don't I know. Mean, I know I'm right in certain areas in terms of nylon and nylon 66, and, and really that's geared towards the leather craft market and who are so you can use it as hand stitching thread or, or machine sewing primarily. But yeah, in terms of shelf life, we've just noticed issues with it, but that's a, that'd be an, inter I'd, I'd listen to that because I'd like to learn a bit more myself. For a fee, we'll make it look like, you know, what you're talking about and he doesn't. Yeah. Let's write the we'll we'll edit it up. <laughs> you don't even have to write a check. Just give me no, a big, it's, big it's interesting because I have that feeling <laughs> I have that feeling sometimes too. And so I don't, I mean, I'm very careful because I don't, I don't like saying things that I don't know are correct, but also at the yeah. same time, there, there are probably like seven people on the whole planet that couldn't like tell you that you're not correct. I think, I think it's a pretty specific knowledge. So yeah. 
it's uh it's it's, just, it's interesting. It's all. I mean, this I've I had no idea that Nylon Thread had a shelf life. No, and I, I read all of the product descriptions just about on our website, which just takes me hours and hours. And so I just finished the thread one the other day, and I took I think it took me like six, seven hours. This is just the other day I've, I've done prior research, but just to understand it to the full extent, you know, in terms of how it's described, how it's used, and so forth. So go spend seven hours, and you'll know just as much as me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I bet. I, I wonder how. I mean, I'm sure storage has a has an impact on that. I wonder how it like like out of direct sunlight, not too hot or cold. Yeah, that's kind of like moisture. Hot. You know, we've we've had occasional issues over the years. We've developed a pretty strong lacquer, um, which is proprietary. You didn't think it was kind of just buy it off the shelf, but we've developed a pretty strong lacquer. And years ago, we'd have hardware stuck down in the DR or down in Mexico, high humid, um, high heat area, and we occasionally see some tarnish marks appear on the hardware. Now, what also happens is in those areas, you make a bag down to Leon and the hardware is attached and it sits in a container again for a couple of months. We'll see some uh, excretion of the oils that will get attached to the lacquer coating. And we tend to see it on antique brass, strangely, because they're all lacquer coated, but we'll occasionally see that too. So it's not a shelf life issue. It's, you know, it can be an environmental issue as well. I am. Interesting. Fully experienced many of those issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's several big things that we've got in the pipeline, but I think there's a couple that are pretty, I think there's a lot of value add to a couple of things that we're bringing in. Um, the thread should be a good value add in consistency and availability. The new hand press that I sent to you, I mean, we've been working on that for two and a half years. And it's like a foot a, press though, right? It's a kick press, but it's convertible. So you can have it on your tabletop. I mean, th there is many questions that went into it. You know, who are we selling to? Who's our client? Well, our client's both the crafter and the manufacturer. Um, so we want it to be accessible to both. We don't want to have three, four different presses. You know, we'd like to have one that's, that works well in every environment. You know, it's got the forward, it's got the pushback because certain people like the pulling for rivet presses. Some people like the back. So ours is convertible. Yeah. Um, Smart. It's got yeah, it's, it's got accessory components. We're actually making an iteration to it. So it's got an overhang over the table so you can fit a bag into it. But we looked at tons of presses on the market. And as I mentioned, we're, we, we saw what made those good. And we added those elements to our new press all in one, you know, with a variety of other features. So it's taken way too long. I thought it'd be a six month project. It's been two and a half years. But I, what I wanted to be is I wanted to be the new modern press of the leather craft manufacturing uh, uh, I guess, environment or, or industry, you know, that we iterate to and add components to kind of like the iPhone, you know, you can add different types of accessories as you go. I want that to be this press as you want to, you know, we were thinking about an item now, right now you have to use say a four ton press in order to get a logo stamp. Well, we're thinking about making an accessory component for the hand press that you can stamp your leather goods with um, and attach your dies. So we're trying to think what do people need and kind of achieve that with a one-stop shop for a hand press. So that that's a big product we hope will do well. Yeah, I think it will. All right, I want to end on favorites. You may, you may have seen some episodes before, Hugh, yeah. with, the, <laughs> with the favorites. What are you into these days uh, that is not related to Buckle Guy? What's keeping your, uh, I don't know how to I think about what entertainment does for me. What's keeping you relaxed, I would say, is what it does for me. <laughs> de-stressing well, yeah I, I you know i guess there's two two sides you know i get sucked into you know emails and stuff at night you know either probably a book at, at night favorites book i'm reading guy Jin at the moment which is great so it's kind of a de-stressor at night trying to separate yourself from work um what is james, that? Clavel, james clavel he's i guess it's, it's fiction historical fiction um oh, cool. but he's written maybe sort of shogun or they, they did tv show i think pierce brosnan was in that like in the 80s or something um so yeah he does just some great pretty pretty low-key books you know it's kind of historical piece but it's very much fiction but they're good so in terms of de-stressor i'm enjoying that one and they're big they're like 1200 page books so they take me like half a year sometimes to read them not a quick reader but that's great um other favorite activity, fishing. I mean, we're at springtime now. Stripers are starting to come up through, uh, I think, out of the Chesapeake up through New York and slowly into Mass. So, yeah, fishing rods coming out. So that, nice. that would probably be my spring-summertime hobby. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. It's funny. I don't know if you remember, Nick. Uh, 
we used to fish in my pond in my neighborhood when we were kids. Calling that fishing is a very generous uh, <laughs> definition of fishing, or very liberal, I would say. I remember being very scared of the worms. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, we were talking about before we turned the uh, the cameras on, and my favorite, which I just started watching yesterday, I think I'm almost done, is Jury Duty. Yeah. And that's the, it's like Amazon freebie show. So here's my pitch for for that show. If you like The Office, you should watch the show. If you think reality TV is like dumb, which I do, and you want it to be mocked a slight amount, watch the show. And then if you like comedy, watch the show. I had several laugh out loud moments. It's really good. And, and, and it's free. You, yeah. And if you think humanity is going to hell, I also think it's a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> you just, I mean, you just want to be that guy. I mean, he is just. He's awesome. I don't want to give anything away, but it's just like, you just want to. You want to be, you want to like take his characteristics and. You know, I didn't tell the, the gist of it. So it's, the show is a fake trial and there's, everybody's an actor except for one dude. That's the show. And it's, yeah. it feels very much like The Office. So it's a, it is a reality show, but all, everyone's actors except for one person. Yeah. There's one guy who doesn't know it's a reality show. And it reminds me of a show from 20 years ago called The Joe Schmo Show. Do you remember that? <laughs> that show was incredible. <laughs> they, I want to watch it again. I remember they, like the elimination process, like they had everybody's picture on a plate. And they would, if you got kicked off the show, they would throw your plate into the fireplace <laughs> and say, you're dead to me. <laughs> like how the, how the guy that didn't, pick, so funny. how the guy didn't pick up on it. And everyone was such a caricature. It was like the old retired guy in like the smoking jacket. And like, it was, so, it, was it, it was, was great. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't great in like large doses, but if in small quantities, I wonder if it holds up. I wonder if it's still funny. Well, what's your favorite then? I, I'll give you last because you need the most time to think about. Uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, we we've had a bunch of customer visits lately, like um, existing and potential. And this, I've got this this journal here, but we had a company in called Plotter, and it's a Japanese company, and um, it's, sure appropriate, it's appropriate because their I think their hardware is good. They've it's like a it's like a refillable. It's old school. It's like a refillable binder. Um. Pl plotter, P L O T T E R, yeah. and uh, but like the inserts, there's like that that pen insert comes out, and like the the elastic insert is like another insert. It's like it's very thoughtfully engineered and very modular. I should have met with them. I blew them up. Nick's like, "Oh, plotters here. They'd like to come see your workshop." And I'm like, "No, <laughs> no, I was just well, so I busy." You like, and you're like, "Well, when?" And I'm like. Seven minutes. Yeah. It, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't like the there was a, a lot of warning given, but anyway they they don't they don't currently use our stuff at least on their like that you can buy. But um, I've always wanted to be more of a notebook user, and and I'm slowly getting to. I've got there's some company I'm forgetting the name, but they're like daily planners, and you can lay out what you want to get achieved for the day, for the week, for the month, etc. And they've got different varieties, but I'm just trying to get into it and be more mindful in terms of a list for the day, but I've always wanted to be more of a, I think I still have the same Shinola one that I got like 12 years ago. It's half. <laughs> not even, <laughs> not even started on. You know what's funny about actual journals for the, the use for me is I'm very much visual. Like I, anything that I want to be reminded of, I need to see it. So I will send myself like email remind the, my to-do list is my email and this little paper notebook. Okay. And I just okay. leave that at my desk so that I don't like journal in it. It's like, don't forget this thing. And I, if I don't have that in front of me, I will forget that thing. <laughs> I'm the same way. Yeah, I'm always, so I have emails yeah, for myself. Email. Many I'll emails even tell my wife sometimes. I'm like, look, you know, if it's if it's during the workday and I'm on the phone and Jasper's going to say I'm on the warehouse, but I just email me. You know, I'll I'll see it in email, and that's kind of it's like my day day to day planner as well. Yeah, it works. Hey. Yeah. Hey, thanks again so much, Hugh. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, it was All great. Right. It's great to see you. All right. You as well. <laughs> <laughs>